Uh, I'm Jamie Henning, and I'm president and CEO for the Greeley Area Chamber of Commerce. I have the opportunity to introduce our next topic, climate, air quality, and the regulatory environment. Until about three years ago, NCLA's work solely focused on the annual legislative session, orienting our work to the policy decisions of our elected leaders. Now our work is a year-round endeavor as we brace and tackle the regulatory pursuits impacting our key industry sector in Northern Colorado, from our economic legacy sectors of oil and gas and agriculture to sectors in building, manufacturing, and transportation. Climate is at the crux of the majority of the regulatory burdens unfolding with the air quality and reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, taking center stage to address climate change. We're joined today by the architect of the state's multifaceted approach to tackling climate change, Executive Director of the Colorado Energy Office, Will Tour, uh, alongside air quality law regulatory expert, Chris Colclater of Beatty Wozniak, and air quality science expert, Eric Hodex of Ramble. So thank you so much, all of you, for being on today. Um, Sandra will join us at the end to moderate a discussion among our speakers. Um, but we'll begin today with Will, Executive Director of the Colorado Energy Office. Will, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much and it's great to be here this morning. Um, what I thought I would do is just take a few minutes to kind of describe the big picture of climate policy in the state and a few of the things that are sort of most timely right now. So back in 2019 the legislature passed House Bill uh, 191261 that set economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions targets for the state based upon what science says needs to be achieved globally, essentially, in order to maintain a stable climate. Our targets are a 50% reduction in pollution levels below 2005 levels by 2030, and a 90% reduction by 2050. The, the governor, after the passage of that legislation, tasked the Energy Office to work with um, several other relevant state, state agencies outside technical consultants, the academic community, and stakeholders in the public to develop a strategic greenhouse gas roadmap that would really be the action plan for how are we going to achieve these targets in a way that works for Colorado. And what, what came out of that was a near-term action plan that really guiding what we're doing this year in 2021 and what we'll be doing next year in 2022 that is focused on, on how we can most effectively and cost-effectively achieve emissions reductions from really the five largest sectors of uh, greenhouse gas pollution, you know, electricity, transportation, the oil and gas industry, other industrial activities, and emissions from um, basically heating buildings are our five largest sectors. And... You know, I'll start with, with electricity. The electricity is, in many ways, uh, the heart of our, of our strategy. It's where we have the, the largest opportunity for near-term emissions reductions. And as the electricity sector gets cleaner and cleaner, it opens up the opportunity to expand those impacts through electrification of other sectors, such as the transition to electric vehicles. A lot of what has made uh, electricity such an uh, exciting area in this arena has been the remarkable price decline that we've seen in renewables over the last 15 years, where wind and solar went from being expensive sources of energy to right now, in many cases, the uh, cheapest sources of energy available. This really came to the fore in 2018 when Excel Energy did their um, all sources solicitation and got hundreds of bids for new utility scale wind, solar, and solar and storage, with many bids coming in at prices under two cents per kilowatt hour for the, the cost to the utility for that electricity, as compared to the cost of simply operating and maintaining existing older um, coal fire generation that was typically in the four to four and a half cents per kilowatt hour range. Um, that led to what uh, Dwayne Hiley, the CEO of Tri-State Generation and Transmission, our second largest utility in the state, describes as the opportunity of a green dividend. So for, for Tri-State, you know, they're headed towards retiring all of their coal generation in Colorado and New Mexico, replacing it with wind and solar. 
and have been able to reduce the rate they charge to their member co-ops by 8%. That's what he sort of describes as that green dividend. Um, it, Excel is certainly the, the largest uh, utility in the state. And we're right in the, the middle of a really Im important um, effort at the Public Utilities Commission right now. It is the approval of Excel's electric resource plan that really maps out where they'll be headed over the next decade. And interestingly, things have moved so quickly that you know, three years ago when Excel be became the first major utility to commit to getting to an 80% pollution reduction by 2030, it set a new bar nationwide. Well, based upon a settlement agreement or a partial settlement agreement in their electric resource plan that the energy office, other state agencies, Excel, and many other parties signed just last week, we'll actually be getting closer to a 90% reduction by 2030, all while at the same time being able to address in a really meaningful way the just transition concerns in affected communities, of, you know, particularly Pueblo and Hayden. So, so we're headed towards very rapid emissions reductions in electricity. On the transportation side, it's really the, the big action that we see is primarily in the realm of electrification. So we're, we've seen very rapid increase in the adoption of electric vehicles in Colorado. I was actually just recently looking at the most recent data from the last several months. And what we're now seeing is that about 10% of new vehicle sales are electric vehicles. And that's in, in a world where we do not yet have um, much availability of electric SUVs or any of electric pickup trucks, which will be coming, you know, over the, the next year or two, we're, we're going to see much more availability in those sectors. As a comparison, just a few years ago, we, the market share was down around 1%. So just remarkable, remarkable growth happening there. And from a state policy perspective, the really big action in, in that arena over the next year is flowing out of Senate Bill 260, the large uh, transportation funding bill from last year uh, that created three new transportation electrification enterprises that will collectively invest about three quarters of a billion dollars over the next decade in both supporting fleet transition and helping to build out electric vehicle infrastructure. Those enterprises are all by statute required to develop their 10-year investment plans and have those completed by next June. And for folks who are interested in that arena, there will be public processes for each one of those 10-year plans to, to build out those fleet and in infrastructure programs. Um, an another important piece on transportation is the work that CDOT is doing to expand travel options for tra travel travelers to make sure that we have opportunities for driving, for transit, for being able to walk and bike for shorter trips and I know that you have another another segment on transportation, so won't get into that, but certainly there's important activities happening at CDOT with the development of the transportation GHG pollution standard. Um, in, the, in the other sectors, you know, oil and gas, there's clearly a, a lot happening on, on the emissions front. You know, notably at the Air Quality Control Commission, there is a, a rulemaking uh, happening you know, this fall that is focused on achieving the statutorily re required 60% emission reduction from that sector by 2030. On the industrial side, there was rulemaking earlier this summer focused on some of our largest um, industrial operations, the, really the steel mill in Pueblo and the, the three major cement facilities in the state that uh, established sort of new, new systems for those industries to reduce their emissions over time. And then on the buildings front, there was a very active legislative session la last year to create new incentives for uh, increasing efficiency and increasing use of things like high efficiency heat pumps in buildings. And there will be multiple public utilities commissions um, dockets moving in 2022 to implement the, the legislation that was uh, adopted last spring. Um, I think the final thing that I would note in this sort of whirlwind tour on, on climate policy, 
is that there's a, a really important role here, you know, not just for legislation and regulation, but for partnership with communities in the private sector and for public investment to help move this forward. And as part of that, the governor has pr proposed in his budget a really transformational air quality investment um, plan for the coming legislative session that includes a $424 million request in air quality improvement, about half or a little more than half of that focused on transportation, another chunk focused on helping to move towards more efficient buildings, and, and a significant piece that is focused on grants to industry for voluntary decarbonization efforts and voluntary air quality improvement efforts in the industrial sector. So a lot of opportunities that could, could flow from um, that proposal if the legislature moves it forward. And with that, I will pass it on to the next speaker. Well, thanks for your update today. We're now gonna turn it over to Chris Kolkleser with Beatty and Wozniak. Good morning, thank you very much. And I appreciate that uh, director tour. So we do have statutory greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, as director tour mentioned, there are economy-wide goals and there are also sector-specific goals for electric generating units, oil and gas facilities, uh, industrial manufacturing, as well as energy intensive trade exposed industries. Um, the state has been moving pretty quickly to implement these goals and, and hit the targets. And it's doing so through a regulatory approach, very centered on regulations. Um, and those include air quality control commission rulemakings for oil and gas, for the energy intensive trade exposed industries. Um, the energy office is doing a building use energy, building energy use intensity benchmark program to be followed by an AQCC rulemaking. Um, CDOT is doing a transportation planning greenhouse gas rule. Uh, the PUC is doing, has done clean energy plans, transportation electrification plans, uh, clean heat plans are coming up next year. Um, the Oil and Gas Commission has done its mission change rulemaking. There was an attempted rule about uh, commuting, employee commuting, although that rule was withdrawn, and there is more on the horizon next year. Uh, and I would say having worked as a, a former regulator and worked at the Air Pollution Control Division, they're literally adopting regulations as fast as they can. I, I do not think this agency could do could adopt more regulations in a single year than it has done, although the staff may grow next year as the uh, if Governor Polis's budget is adopted. Uh, so we've definitely taken a regulation centric approach uh, driven for a couple of reasons. One is that the governor opposes cap and trade. Uh, a second is that while an economist would tell you that uh, the carbon price could be more efficient than regulations, there's really no appetite for a carbon tax and that would need to go to the voters through Tabor uh, if there were to be a, a policy like that. So we've really defaulted to a, a kind of regulation focused top down approach. And that, that has pros and cons. Uh, a number of people look at regulations and say that that provides certainty. Uh, a number of people equate adopting additional regulations with climate leadership. Uh, there are also uh, downsides. I would say some look at regulations and say that the, the state needs to have additional flexibility, really more um, incentives so that um, operators could achieve these reductions perhaps at lower cost. And I would mention the cost have been significant. So a lot of my work is, is for the oil and gas industry. Um, if you look at the regulations that the AQCC and the Oil and Gas Commission has adopted since 2018, just based on the cost the state has recognized in their estimates, it's over annual regulatory cost just for the oil and gas industry. And that will go up this year. So in a couple of weeks, the Air Commission will consider regulations with a proposed cost between 60 and $142 million, according to the Air Division. And so that, that's on top of the 200 million, which does not include all of the costs. Uh, for example, um, pneumatic controller regulation in February of this year, uh, for that rule, the costs are not quantified and so they're not included. So we're really looking at between a third and a half of a billion dollars in annual annual regulatory costs for this single industry in order to achieve these GHG goals. So there's really quite a bit of costs that are involved in this regulatory strategy. Now, regulations have an effect. Uh, I used to be a regulator. We definitely need rules to have a level playing field and to have uh, protect public health and safety. But I would say that they're not the only incentive 
and that other incentives can be more powerful. Uh, as you heard Director Tour mention, the decreased cost of renewables as well as natural gas electric generation really drove a switch from coal and reduced GHG emissions significantly and continues to do so. Um, for the oil and gas industry, operators need a social license to operate, and that has driven many changes that go uh, beyond or are separate from the regulatory requirements, including um, a switch to so-called tankless production, reducing truck traffic by piping the oil and the water away from the facilities, and, and going beyond state requirements in terms of monitoring and using new technologies to reduce emissions. All of this has had an effect. Uh, in fact, as I think you'll hear from Eric Kodak in a few minutes, Colorado is has seen very significant reductions in methane emissions. Um, Weld County did some monitoring data that shows uh, a 50% reduction in ambient methane concentrations in the DJ Basin between 2013 and 2019. Won't steal too much of Eric's thunder. And just recently, the Environmental Defense Fund, in a filing with the Air Commission, um, calculated that the oil and gas industry is on track before you even um, get to this December rulemaking that's coming up. The oil and gas industry is already on path to meet its 2025 GHG reduction target. So there's really a lot that's been happening. Um, but I would say on the flip side, in my view, we're, we're sort of reaching the limits of the ability of regulations in order to, to mandate economic changes through regulatory powers. Uh, one encouraging sign, in my view, is that in this upcoming GHG rulemaking at the Air Commission, they're considering a uh, performance-based program that would tell operators what GHG reduction target they have to meet without actually telling them how to get there. So it would set a goal, it would say that they have to get their emissions below a certain level, but how the operator does it is up to them. So for some operators, that may mean reducing emissions from tanks. For others, it, it may mean pneumatic controllers. But the operator has the flexibility to choose how it gets to the target. And there's sort of a built-in feedback loop. So each year, the operator would have to look at what their emissions were and submit a report. And if they were on path, that's great. If not, they have to do more in order to get to that target. And so this sets a performance standard that operators have to meet that gives them flexibility to do it. I think it's a very encouraging approach that the Air Commission is looking at in December. Uh, there was some initial public resistance to that, I would say, but uh, looking at the, the latest filings, most of the parties who had initially objected to this GHG intensity program uh, are, are no longer objecting. Um, so I just to step back and ask where, where does that leave us? So in my view, the Colorado business community does need to continue reducing greenhouse gases. There are a number of pressures to do that. Your customers, your investors, your neighbors, your employees and their families, they increasingly demand that you operate sustainably. Um, you've got ESG goals in order to get to to operate more sustainably. The public is all seeing wildfires and drought and people are aware of the impacts in, of climate change. In fact, I recently saw the term AQI standing for air quality index in a crossword puzzle. So this is in the public consciousness for sure. So I would encourage industries in Colorado to take a, a clear eyed look at where you stand at what your emissions are. Uh, you may not have been regulated yet, but the state is definitely moving aggressively to regulate um, many, many sectors of the economy in order to reach GHG goals. And there is an opportunity, there are ways to do this that can actually make money, that can find these opportunities to reduce cost and be cost effective. And so I would encourage industries to, to really get ahead of this and look at this. Um, if you're an industry that has not been a regulatory target yet, your day is probably coming. And I think it's it's worth your while to look at how you can respond to this and, and get ahead of it. I, I would just note one example. So I briefly mentioned the ETRIP rule, the Employee Traffic Reduction Program, that would have um, required employers to adopt measures to encourage or to give options to their employees to get out of their cars and encourage them to use other modes of transportation. That regulation failed and was withdrawn due to some pretty significant public opposition. Um, it, was, it was actually very eye-opening when, when I read the written public comments, the state received about 130 written public comments, two supported the regulation, about 100 were opposed, and, and the rest took no position, yes or no. So that regulation was withdrawn. But in response to that, the business community working with transportation management agencies is really looking at ways that industry can have a business-led initiative to sort of partner with their employees and find ways to reduce uh, vehicle traffic, making progress towards the state's GHG goals, but doing it in a, a more 
business focused way that is not as as top heavy or, or top down. So I think that there are many opportunities here looking at um, biogas, carbon sequestration, renewables, energy efficiency. There are many things that can be done. Um, and I just encourage industry, even if you are not being regulated yet, to develop a strategy for ways that you can meet the statutory GHG goals in a way that works for you. Chris, thank, thank you, you so much for your thoughts and insights. It's a really important issue. So thank you again for joining us. Um, our final speaker today, before we go over to uh, Sandra, who will be uh, facilitating a conversation between them all, is Eric Hodek with the Rample Group. Eric, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and figure out how I can get my screen up here. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm going to focus a lot on the science behind the policies and, and what should be informing um, the development of our policies. I want to start with ozone. Um, and I want folks to remember ozone is, uh, is not emitted. It is formed in the troposphere. It's a very complex reaction. Um, certain volatile organics, not methane, not ethane, form free radicals. And then those react with oxygen in the presence of UV radiation to form ozone. And then um, nitrogen oxides uh, participate in this reaction, both as a catalyst and a scavenger, um, which either can either increase the rate of reaction, um, but it can also consume reactants. And so when it's emitted um, is also very important to this reaction and, uh, and our ozone levels. Indeed, it's why you find things what, like we call the weekend effect or the prolonged weekend effect that we see going on now with COVID with less commuter traffic because less NO2 is actually available to scavenge early morning um, um um, our early morning emissions of VOC, and therefore uh, we actually uh, uh, we actually see an increase uh, in in ozone levels, even though we see traffic decreases. But the the key is here is that it's a very complex reaction that depends on meteorology, topography, relative concentrations, and the specific VOCs emitted. Certain VOCs like aldehydes are are much more highly reactive, um, so it, it's not a simple problem. Um, so. Let's talk about ozone source regions. Um, the, you know, we did some modeling to look at the ozone source regions estimated from what's called back trajectory modeling. So we we start at the monitor and we 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 take um, probable. It, we use a probabilistic uh, back trajectory model to say, okay, at the times of violation, where do we think these emissions are coming from? Uh, this is what the seismopleth you see in front of you um, maps that out. The 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 hotter colors, the red, yellows, and oranges indicate the highest probability of the point of emission. The cooler colors indicate very low probabilities to almost no probability. Um, so we can monitor the ozone concentrations, but because it's not emitted, how do we know where it comes from? Um, what we see here, depicted here, are the ozone monitors in the Denver Metro North Front Range and the maximum concentrations that they're monitoring. The isopleth shows these probabilistic distributions of the origin emissions from the previous 24 hours. Uh, the back trajectory points for each hour in the eight hour period against the form of the standard. Um, and what this analysis shows us that the, source, the, the sources in orange and yellow are most likely to contribute. The areas in cooler shades are, are likely do not. What we see is this finger of green uh, that I've got highlighted here at the Fort Collin West monitor shows, shows that emissions are following the cash Laputer um, and shows elevated contribution um, depicting a channel flow of emissions upslope to those monitors. Um, we also note that in this figure, uh, areas in the north and east of Well County that show low frequency of contribution um, and has identified a monitoring gap. And in fact, Well County has actually embarked upon a monitoring program on the northeast and southeast sides of, of the county boundary uh, in order to help um, um, better refine the models and, and, and track these emissions. 
In addition, the Regional Air Quality Control Council conducts regional photochemical modeling to assess what are the sources of air pollution that contribute the most. This is by sector. Um, this information is used to inform states' plan to regulate emissions to bring the area into attainment. Uh, what we, what's shown here is the distribution of sources within the non-attainment area contributing to these highest measured ozone days. And what we see is that the major contributors change as we go from north to south. Um, at the Fort, Co uh, Fort Collins West Monitor, we see that oil and gas sources are contributing 34% of the ozone, decreasing to only 11% as you travel south to the Chatfield Monitor. Uh, the Fort Collins West shows the impact of this potential emissions transport that I showed. Um, but conversely, motor vehicle, lawn, construction contribute more as you travel south. So what does this mean? It means that the profile em emissions and the necessary control actually vary greatly between the northern side of the non-attainment area and the southern side of the non-attainment area. Um, it also shows that where the monitors are highest, the impacts are driven more by residential and computer emissions than it is by stationary sources. Additionally, the RAC evaluates contributions to the violation of mo violating monitors on a geographic distribution. This map depicts the modeling domain and the sources um, are aggregated into the west, the east, non-attainment area. And then for the first time, the RAC has analyzed the contribution from northern Larimer and Weld counties. This is significant because it's actually, you know, pending rulemaking to extend the non-attainment boundary all the way to the, to the Wyoming border and just in Weld County not in Larimer County. Um, and the pie charts show on the right that show the distribution of the contribution of those regions to the model ozone concentrations. What's interesting is these thin blue slivers here at the 12 o'clock position show the contributions from Northern Larimer or Well County, less than 1% at all monitors. Um, yet there seems to be a very vocal public call to include this region in the non-attainment area for no other reason than it couldn't hurt. So as Chris had alluded to, um, there was uh, satellite, there is satellite data that has been collected over the past um, more than a decade. Or, um, and what we find is that based on the satellite data, ambient methane concentrations adjusted for background have decreased 52% in the denver Julesburg Basin since its peak in 2013. Um, according to COGCC records, oil production has doubled. Gas production is up 20% across the same time period. Um, I would also note that ground-based monitoring at Platteville and other places um, corroborate these trends for both methane and, eth and, methane and ethane. Um, this demonstrates the efficacy of the regulatory controls in Colorado since 2011, but it also suggests that the oil and gas inventories currently being used to inform policy do not adequately account account for the recent regulatory changes or operational controls. To be blunt, um, it, it is not the same error that we had in 2011, and a lot of the data being used is, is uh, over a decade old. So, to summarize uh, on the ozone issues, ozone formation transport is very complex science. You can't really point to a single industry or source category. Um, there are multiple factors that vary regionally, sub-regionally, and even seasonally. Um, there is significant influence from transport into and within the region um, as, uh, on, on the formation of ozone. And depending upon what's the, the sub-regional sensitivity, um, emissions reductions um, may actually result in a dis benefit. There's a, a whole other presentation I could go into regarding scavenging and titration. Um, and, and, to, and then the drivers for ozone today um, are not the same as they were in 2011. Um, so the, the modeling is a key decision tool to test the impacts of policies. Um, and, and more and better monitoring actually improves the predictive values of this model. They identify pollutant transport, particularly of the highly reactive VOC and the NOx, and, the, and monitoring is, uh, is required to, uh, um, to validate the models and improve their predictive value. So I'd like to go ahead and move on to greenhouse gases in, in the short time that I have. Um, 
The most important thing to remember about greenhouse gases is that regulation is that it is a mesoscale issue and that you have to consider emissions across the entire supply chain. Um, emissions are broken into three categories or what we call scopes. Um, scope one includes the direct emissions from sources that are owned or controlled by a company, such as your stationary combustion, generators, boilers, heaters, um, their fleet vehicles for on-road mobile, off-road mobile for like forklifts and yard tractors, um, and their, their fugitive emissions. Um, scope two includes indirect emissions from purchased energy. So this is the electricity, steam, and heat that they buy in order to make their product. Um, and these, these emissions physically occur at the facility where that energy is generated. So Pawnee Power Plant generates electricity. The emissions from that is their scope one. It's their customer scope two. Um, and then scope three emissions includes the indirect emissions upstream or downstream of the company's operations, um, such as it's in use downstream or it's up or, or it's supply chain upstream. So this would include things like commuting, logistics, um, the, the emissions for, for raw material production. Um, scope three emissions are theoretically optional for reporting purposes, but, they're, but more and more companies are now reporting and acting on them because the realization that their orders of magnitude larger than their scope one and scope two. Um, in fact, private equity firms now um, are looking very heavily at folks' scope three emissions. Um, and as Chris alluded to, um, where ESG is becoming very important now, this is becoming an important component of, of, the, of a company's emissions profile. So on the left, you see the distribution of emissions across the supply chain for different midstream companies, and this is this this is based on based on an aggregation of the car, the 2020 carbon disclosure project. And you will note that the emissions are dominated by scope three downstream. This means that the largest contribution of oil and gas of to to GHG emissions is its in use, not its production. Um, this is predominantly driven by the using hydrocarbons in combustion, as opposed to using the hydrocarbons as feedstock where the carbon remains sequestered in the product. Um, while not insignificant, the intensity of oil and gas production does not contribute to the, a large portion of the total life cycle of emissions, roughly 10%. Um, however, given the state of U.S. production, it is important to take note that of which producing basins um, have lower emissions intensity. And here we see the Denver Basin, the Denver-Julesburg Basin is actually a relatively low intensity of, of, uh, of, of carbon, as opposed to, say, the Peons Basin, which, you know, uh, when compared nationally or benchmarking in other basins is relatively high. So Mr. Tour talked about uh, electrification. There's been a lot of talk about this as the solution to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I would say that the, the efficacy of electrification depends on the carbon intensity of where power of the power production fleet and the purpose for which that electricity is being used. For example, uh, we see the carbon intent here. We see the carbon intensity of the various power producing regions within the United States. This is based on eGrid data uh, published by EPA. With the Rocky Mountain, um, uh, with the Rocky Mountain region coming in at the fifth highest, so according to ERIT, we're about 1243 pound per megawatt hour, um, or one of the more carbon intense regions in the country. Um, for example, then natural gas reciprocating engines can have a carbon intensity anywhere from about a thousand pounds, sometimes lower, but about a thousand pound per megawatt hour for their larger, more efficient units. Um, to about 1,600 pound per megawatt hour for some, some of the smaller, older, less efficient units. So electrification is not necessarily better as a rule. And this does, and, and notwithstanding too, that this is only considers the direct emissions. It doesn't even consider the scope two or scope three emissions that would come from the installation of infrastructure, logistics, transportation, all of the things that would take place to get that or be required to get that electricity to the point of use. Um, we talked a lot about electric vehicles. Um, this is a more promising story. According to the manufacturers, an electric vehicle ranges from about 24 to 30 kilowatt hour per 100 mile. Um, you do the math on our grid, that's about 0.3 to 0.4 pound per VMT, which is a little less than half of what the average fossil fuel vehicle uses. So there's some promise, 
presuming we can resolve issues of availability, infrastructure, reliability, range um, to meet customer needs. Um, because if we're if we're unable to meet customer needs in the electric vehicle space, then the adoption is going to fail. We do see that climb in the market share, but the rate at which that adoption is going to happen is going to be based upon the ability, not just of the vehicles, but of the infrastructure to be able to meet the consumer need. So in summary, you know, greenhouse gas and climate change, they are global, not local issues. Local concentrations of GHG do not correlate to global temperature impacts. It is a mesoscale issue. Um, it's important to note that GHGs do not recognize political boundaries. So policies have to consider leakage, um, which is the migration of GHG emitting sources for, from more regulated to less regulated environments. Um, and so that we don't incentivize production and consumption of energy where it is less efficient and beyond our control to regulate. Um, if you remember nothing else about greenhouse gas, you must consider the life cycle analysis of a project or a policy because we're not dealing with acute local health impacts then the entire supply chain emissions become relevant to the discussion. Um, in oil and gas, direct emissions from production are a fraction of the carbon intensity, a total carbon intensity. Um, so we're going to move the needle not by regulating its production, but by curbing its combustion. Um, the accounting in the inventories also need to be rigorous and consistent because we're talking about life cycle emissions, transparency and verification protocols are required to preclude double counting to ensure that we are actually achieving the real reductions. Um, and then finally, electrification, um, it's not a panacea. And in certain, in certain applications, electrification is actually more carbon intense. It is a tool in the toolkit, but it is not the only one. And if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the, uh, what I mean by this is that there are other policies. There are other um, ways to achieve carbon reductions. Um, electrification is not the only tool in that toolkit. And then finally, for electrification to be successful, we have to reduce the carbon intensity in the electricity supply. Again, the Rocky Mountain grid is the fifth highest in the nation. I think you know what we need to do is look at how do we reduce the carbon intensity of our electricity supply first, and then that is going to enable further, reduc or, uh, further carbon reductions with the use of electrification. So I appreciate everybody's time and welcome your questions during the, during the panel discussion. Wonderful, thank you all so much. I am um, internally grateful to the three of you and your remarkable expertise. Um, climate change, air quality, the regulatory environment, so complex and um, really the the level of detail that you provided Eric to educate and inform about the, the nuance that exists within the, within the discussion is, is really important. But Chris, I also greatly appreciate your um, insights with respect to the full spectrum of impact to the regula regulated environment and um, a special thanks to you for your uh, counsel and guidance through the e-trip process to the NCLA as we um, led and, and engaged in that, in that dialogue. Um, and Will, um, your again being the um, sort of architect of much of the, the the unfolding of the policy and and pursuit of addressing climate change in Colorado and being a leader and at the forefront of that is um, so invaluable to um, the to, to Colorado and the and the importance of addressing the the challenge that faces all of us. So thank you all three of you for joining us. I just have a couple of questions that I wanted to pose um, and throw out. I think the um, I'll start with the electrification conversation because um, that is certainly where we are headed in multiple arenas. And one of the questions that continues to emerge is capacity and alignment of capacity to, as we move towards electrification in the full spectrum beyond just electric vehicles, but in electrifying multitude of, um, of presently carbon um, intense um, processes. Um, how does that align with the availability of capacity on the um, on the grid? And uh, Will, perhaps you can speak to some of that in terms of your expectation of how that um, how that will unfold. Yeah, no, that that's a great question, and 
as with many things, I think there's kind of a nuanced answer to that. So when we look at electrification of transportation, that certainly for light duty vehicles, that's probably the, the easiest place to address the electricity needs because of the fact that the vast majority of charging of electric vehicles takes place at night and with relatively um, modest use of time of use rates, we, we, what we've seen are around the, the country in pilot programs is that it's possible to get people to program their chargers so that they come on later in the evening at the point where there's significant excess capacity on the system. So you can do very widespread electrification of transportation while having to add very little additional capacity. In fact, the modeling that we've had done suggests that the net effect of widespread electrification of vehicles will be to exert downward pressure on electric rates because we'll be taking the fixed costs of the system that are not fully used at night, spreading those over more kilowatt hours. When we start to look at building electrification, I think it gets more complex. And if you were to actually move toward, towards a fully electrified building stock with the use of high efficiency heat pumps for all of your water and space heating, that would create significant new demand on the coldest days of the year. It would move us from a summer peaking to a winter peaking system. And there would be likely significant capacity re requirements in order to, to achieve that. That's part of the reason that the approach that the state of Colorado is taking on building, like, building emissions is very much what Eric was describing, looking at electrification as one tool in the toolbox. But the actual approach that we've taken is to uh, set a performance standard for gas distribution utilities that allows them to use energy efficiency, electrification, insertion of green hydrogen, injection of green hydrogen into the distribution system, and use of recovered methane or renewable natural gas, all as tools in the toolkit, and then al allow sort of a detailed uh, analytical process at the Public Utilities Commission to assess the most cost-effective mi mix of those tools in a sort of ongoing and incremental regulatory process going forward, rather than trying to predict the future today. You know, maybe the future will be all electrification of buildings. Maybe it will involve widespread use of hydrogen and synthetic methane and recovered methane. We just don't know the that answer today. And well, I, I think that the sort of more modest approach that Colorado is taking is a, a good way of addressing those issues. Thank you so much. I think that one of the one of the challenges, and Chris alluded to this earlier, um, as we look towards the future, I think there is a sense, um, and Chris, I'd be, I'd be curious your thoughts on this, there's a sense of moving pretty quickly um, in the full spectrum of industry sectors to move towards electrification, other alternative alternative sources of energy and um, and without sufficient time to respond and the increasing costs attached to that. And Chris, maybe you can speak a little bit to um, the, the pace with which the regulatory environment is unfolding and the need to respond and, and ability to be responsive and, um, and the corresponding costs. Yeah, I certainly appreciate the question. You know, I, I have been on both sides of this issue, both as a regulator and now as an attorney representing regulated entities. Um, so again, there, there's value in a regulatory approach. I think this that the Air Quality Control Commission in particular is being very active in terms of the, the rules that they are implementing, and that's by statutory design. So the legislature put them in charge of, of adopting rules to meet the statutory GHG reduction targets. Um, they are going to be regulating industries that they have not regulated much in the past. So the early regulations really focus on oil and gas and electric generating units. And those are in some ways the easy ones because they're large stationary sources um, and they're industries that are familiar with regulation. As they move on, and you know, I can't give you a number of, of air quality rules that were adopted this year for GHGs. I, I wanna say it's about four um, for oil and gas as well as, uh, as regional haze. But as they move on and need to 
identify uh, other industries that have not been regulated in the past, I think it will become more and more difficult to keep making progress through a regulatory approach. Um, and you, you see a lot of public support for regulations when it's regulating an industry. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, those guys, they need to be regulated. Uh, it's much more difficult when you begin to have regulations that affect individual behavior. Uh, and so that's why I think there is more of a need for incentives. Certainly there are incentives for electric vehicles. Um, and just point out as one example of that, the, uh, there's a, a partnership between NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and UC Boulder that looked at uh, VOC concentrations, and this is more for ozone than greenhouse gases. But, you know, they discovered that about 40% of the VOCs in downtown Boulder were actually from what they call volatile consumer products, things like spray on sunscreen, spray on um cleaners uh, and not so much the the stationary sources that you hear about as often so attempting to regulate that uh, would really be a challenge to get public buy-in so I, I think there are cost concerns there's pace concerns as they're adopting more rules and there's also just the the difference in what they are regulating and uh, how it begins to affect individual behavior very good. Very good. Well, I um, I wanted to ask a question with respect to the leakage concept that Eric had um, had arose in his comments, um, which is a really interesting and interesting conversation. Unfortunately, we are out of time this morning for that conversation. This is such an important discussion, as we all know, and it is it has become. Um, a central point of the work that the NCLA is doing around air quality and climate change. And so you'll be hearing more from the NCLA around these issues. We're so incredibly grateful to have um, Will Tour join us from the Colorado Energy Office. Chris, your great work um, within the processes itself on the regulatory side, and Eric, your expertise on the science and, and the technical aspects of the air quality um, issues are, are just so, um, we're so bent benefit so greatly from all of that and all of you. So thank you so very much for joining us. And we are going to move on to our next topic, um, which is transportation. And let me pull up my notes, my apologies. Um, we are, um, but we are first going to start with uh, an, another sponsor recognition, UC Health. Um, they are our second gold sponsor. And so many of you are familiar with UC Health. They're the innovative nonprofit health system that delivers the highest quality medical care with an excellent patient experience. They include 26,000 employees, 12 acute care full service hospitals, and hundreds of physicians across Colorado, Southern Wyoming, and Western Nebraska. With the University of Colorado Hospital on the CU Anschutz Medical Campus as its academic anchor and the only adult academic medical center in the region, UC Health is dedicated to providing unmatched patient care in the Rocky Mountain West. Offering more than 150 clinic locations, UC Health pushes the boundaries of medicine, providing advanced treatments and clinical trials and improving health through innovation. Here's a quick video from UC Health. To say that last year was the most daunting and trying year we have ever faced as a healthcare system would be a significant understatement. As the pandemic swept into our state and started to fill our facilities with critically ill patients, everything changed for every one of us. But throughout the whole year, one thing kept spreading that couldn't be stopped. Kindness. We saw kindness every single day. Between friends, coworkers, staff, and patients, and oftentimes, perfect strangers. Whether a grand gesture that impacted a large group, or an intimate moment between two people, every single act of kindness was needed at that very moment because it provided strength, energy, and hope. And it let people know that they weren't in this alone. Kindness is healthcare. Kindness improves lives. Kindness is extraordinary. And every moment that every one of you selflessly puts someone else ahead of yourself is a moment that helped make 2020 a profound year of kindness. <laughs>